Define embracing the weird. Well, uh, the book is really meant to just have people acknowledge how different we are from each other and make that individuality um, something we lead with. I think a lot of the times people kind of bury the things that make them different from each other. Um, but really, those are kind of our superpowers. That's what makes us stand out, especially when we look at creativity. Nobody ever shared a video because it was like every other video, right? <laughs> Do we all have the weird? Yeah, we got, all got the weird, Larry. <laughs> we have to, when we better get a definition. What's the definition of weird? All right. Um, I mean, I think weird is anything that differs from the mainstream sort of cliche of something. I mean, I think I, in my life, have embodied that a lot. I've always felt a little bit outside the norm. Um, I was homeschooled as a kid. I never, I went to college when I was 16. I always kind of been on the outside looking in, um, which has kind of been my advantage as a creator, but also made me feel a little bit separated from everybody a lot in my life. And so when I finally acknowledged like, oh, these are my strengths, the things that separate me from other people, that's when I really kind of took off and, and you know, not only in my career, but in my creativity and just appreciating myself more. How would you describe your career? Uh, Multifaceted. Weird <laughs> and quirky. I guess I, I, guess I embody that quirky word. Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely don't like to stay on one path. I have a lot of interests, and I, uh, I probably could have gotten farther in one lane, but I just enjoy driving in all lanes at once. <laughs> Why did you write the book? So I wrote the book because um, I wrote a memoir several years ago called You're Never Weird on the Internet Almost. And after people wrote, read that book, I heard so often that people would come up to me and say, I started creating, you know, I started writing because of you. I started taking improv classes or I started doing art because of you. And I also got help uh, around my creative, uh, you know, anxiety and depression. And those two things were so important and impactful. When you see people actually have their life changed a little bit for the positive because of what you do, uh, I was really um, touched by it. So I wanted to make a book that wasn't just about my personal journey, it was about the reader's journey. And so it's an interactive book, um, kind of a self-help book in a sense, but I wanted to make a funny one that people would laugh at. Are you classified as depressed? Um, I've lived with anxiety disorder my whole life for sure. And occasionally in my life, especially when stress and uh, you know things get a little bit out of whack, I've definitely been very depressed. Uh, mostly it's anxiety that has really ruled my life in a, in a big, significant way, and that's why a very large chapter in the book is a, a based around handling your anxiety and dealing with it, um, because it's held me back a lot. I haven't been my authentic self in front of people because my anxious self kind of takes over. You think you're always being judged? A little bit. I was homeschooled, so I really wasn't around any other children during my whole uh, you know, childhood, and then I got a, a, a full scholarship to University of Texas at Austin, uh, for violin, so I was a violinist, but I went to college, this 50,000 person college, at age barely 16, right? So I didn't get a, a normal sense, you know, of college, because I, I couldn't really go out with the other people, they couldn't really interact with me, I couldn't date. Um, my mom drove me to college, so. You still play? I still play a little bit, um, just just for fun. I, I want to introduce my daughter to it, although she says mama too loud a lot. <laughs> <laughs> when I play. So, you know, and I was I, I was kind of on the track to becoming a professional violinist. I was in the Austin Symphony. Um, but I decided, because I had this thing inside of me that said, I want to be an actor. I want to go to Hollywood. And I graduated, and bam, I was on a bus out to Hollywood to be an actor. Really not qualified. <laughs> what do you think of homeschooling? I love it. I mean, really? I, I really want to homeschool my daughter. I, um, I feel like it is, it enabled me to be um, uninhibited in who I am and follow the interests in a way that were was not kind of dampened by being in a classroom setting. In your first book, you talk about, quote, naive confidence yeah. to forge your own path. How did your unconventional upbringing help to bring you where you are? I mean, I think part of it was just being proud of the things that made me different. I mean, really, I think especially for women, we learn a lot of things early on in our life, how the world works in a sense, quote unquote, and a lot of that is uh, closed doors to a lot of things, um, especially successful paths that men kind of forge to be leaders in this world, right? And I notice this a lot with my daughter when I read her books, you know, um, no matter what character it is, if they're a carrot or if they're a rabbit, it's usually a he. They're the hero of the story. And if it's a he hero, they're out there making mistakes and being victorious and saving other people. When it's a, a female character, if, she, if we ever get a her character, she's kind of a little more marginalized and she's taking care of other people and she's being kind and things like that. So I think we learn a lot of gender roles through um, just society and what people say 
this is how the world works. Well, I didn't really learn how the world works, really. And so when I look at, you know, things that people just take for granted, I kind of question them. I feel like that's actually an advantage in life. What made you a gamer? Well, I was very lonely as a child, as you can imagine. I had no friends, really. I mean, I would see people in classes and stuff, but we didn't hang out, like, on a playground. Um, and so I started using whatever means it was, you know, we're social creatures, right? So I started using a, a computer very early on. Um, my grandfather was a nuclear physicist, and he kind of gave us these uh, laptops that were kind of as big as this uh, table. And so my, you know, I would see my mom log on to, like, early Internet things, like CompuServe and these really proto-Internet uh, places and communicate with people, and I wanted to do that. So I just kind of leapt on, and I would just talk to people in forums and chat and all those things, and that kind of taught me that the Internet was a place that con I could connect with people. And really you became early. A, an influencer. I mean, I guess so, yeah. I mean, I was one of the first actors to really jump into social media, and I started making content very, very early, like the year after YouTube started. I, I started making videos out of my garage. Um, so I just did it because I... I think it goes again back to identity and like being weird and being outside the mainstream and not really being accepted by mainstream Hollywood. But then I was like, well, I'm still me. I'm proud of who I am. Let's make a video and show people who I am. And, you know, it happened to succeed. So You created a show that explores gaming subculture called The Guild. Understand it had millions of views on YouTube. What made you decide to create that series? Yeah, I started that series uh, back in like 2007 is when we started it, and it was the beginning of internet video. And um, I had been an actor for several years. I moved to L.A. to be a star, and we, as we all do, right? And I got a wake-up call because I certainly don't fit in any mold, I think, especially at the time that anybody kind of uh, uh, acknowledged as something they'd want to show on TV. <laughs> I worked a lot. I was on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I started out my, my career on, like, Bring It On Again and very you know, cool projects, but I never was so, I felt like I was fully embraced as who I was. Um, when I told people I played video games or I was like a math major, they would like look at me like I'm a weirdo. And so I felt very uh, much like I didn't have a home in Hollywood. And so when I started um, doing sketch comedy, a, f a couple of friends of mine started making videos and uploading to this new thing called YouTube. And I was like, well, let's do this. And I have a story I'd like to tell about video game addiction because I've been through this myself. I just want to show the world um, you know, this slice of life. Tell me about Geek and Sundry. How do you created that? Yeah, I, so after the Guild was, it was one of the first um, web series that people um, online watched and it was very successful. My outfit from the Guild is now in the Smithsonian on display in the really? American History Museum. Yeah, they, wow. they used it as an example of new media but also women pioneering in the world of gaming and, um, and digital media. So it's pretty cool. It's on display right now, right around the corner from the Ruby Slippers from Wizard of Oz, so it's on the third floor. <laughs> well, tell me about the geek. Geek and Sundry. So a couple years after that, I had an opportunity to start a company of multiple shows, and I, you know, rather than sort of jump on a, a, a TV show as a regular on a, an actor, I was like, I want to do this because this is cooler, this is new, and I want to see what I can do here. So I built the company up. We really had a lot of shows based on tabletop gaming and video games, but also cosplay, all sorts of like geek culture, just it was kind of emerging from the shadows. And I sold the company to Legendary Entertainment. I worked there a couple of years and I left um, after I had a baby. Cause I just, I, as a creator, I wanted to be able to do my creative creativity and- Did you on. see online coming, digital content? Did you see all that? I mean, yeah, I was, but like I said, like since I was seven years old, I was on early internet, you know, before anybody had internet, I had internet in, in a sense. And so I had been taught early on that you could connect with people online in a way that was kind of pioneering. I was on the cutting edge. And I also felt most at home online because that's kind of where I, I found, I could, I could let who I am out more online because I felt like I could connect with people who understood me more. What do you make of disrupted, the, the services, the content connection, what's going on? I mean, right now, I think we're in a, a kind of a depressing time. I got into web video because I wanted to stick it to the man. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. It was almost revenge and spite that I was like, yes, I'm going to stay here, undermining what you guys have built up that you wouldn't let me in, in a sense. I mean, I know that that's part of what drives me as a person. Um, I think right now it's just mass consolidation. And I think, um, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of sad where you see independent content creators really not able to have a voice because everything's become institutionalized in a way. It's become, um, you know, all the new streaming services are going to deliver us everything we'd ever want, but there's not that sort of independent spirit being Where's represented. Where's it all leading to? 
I mean, I think that it's uh, it's just dismantling the way that we get content, but institutionalizing it in the way that we have a cable box. Remember, I'm sure you know that cable box disrupted TV. It's the same thing. Streaming services will disrupt it. Some of them will fall by the wayside. Some of them will um, stick around and just kind of create a new normal. Um, you know, I think podcasting is something that where you have a little disruption, but again, it's all being becoming institutionalized. So I think we're in kind of in, a, in an era where innovation is not being rewarded as much as institutionalization. And uh, I guess we just all write it out and keep doing our thing, right? That's what I'd try to do. Is it predictable? I mean, I guess, I think the cycles are predictable. You know, I've been through, like there was a whole, about five years ago, there was a whole flood of SVODs and streaming services that were niche and they all went under. So now we have all the big guys coming in and like, I'm gonna make it work. And I'm sure some of them will, of course, but some of them won't. And yeah, it is cyclic. Yeah, yeah. I guess Digital's I- Digital's the best place for content now, right? I mean, I think so. I certainly don't turn my TV on that way. Where much. do you see digital going, say in 10 years? I mean, like I say, I think that, that streaming is basically the new cable box. Whether how, how it you know breaks that whole thing apart is, is gonna be TBD, I guess. But I mean, I hope that, I, I think that if you look at technology, like the iPhone made um, social media happen, right? It was a different technology that we had in our hands that people could innovate creatively around. And I think that that's, that's always gonna be the leap, you know, whether we have like something implanted in our eyes or under our skin, or we're all, you know, using like, uh, holograph uh, glasses to kind of see the world differently, even if we're walking on the same road. Like those are the things that I think will change the way um, creativity will happen because we create given the new tools, right? It's getting a new paintbrush. What can I do with this new paintbrush? Never miss a beat. Subscribe to Larry King now and watch new episodes every day.